I'm delighted to welcome you all to the launch of India, Bharat and Pakistan, The Constitutional Journey of a Sandwich Civilization by J. Sain Deepak. And uh, in a little while from now, we'll also be joined by uh, Honorable Mr. Justice Sri V. Subramaniam, Rama Subramaniam, who's from Supreme Court of India. While let me introduce my uh, panelists here. Uh, uh, we'd like to extend a special welcome to our chief guest, Dr. Minakshi Jain. Dr. Jain is presently senior fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. Her areas of research include cultural and religious developments in Indian history. In 2020, she was awarded the Padam Shri by the Government of India for her contribution in the field of literature and education. And now I'd like to introduce uh, our another uh, panelist, our esteemed moderator and panelist, Dr. Anand Rangnathan. But I'm sure a lot of people are aware he's already teaching as a professor in Special Center for Molecular Medicine at JNU Delhi. And he, I, he's pretty regular. He writes and appears frequently on television debates, on politics, and media, and science. And his columns have appeared in Swarajya DNA, First Post, and News Laundry. And of course, he's written three books earlier. And the fourth one is, I think, is just in this year. It'll be coming? Yeah, great, great. It will be from Penguin. And now a special mention for our uh, coveted author, Mr. J. Sain Deepak. Can we please welcome uh, Honorable Mr. Justice Sri V. Ramasubramanam. She just arrived <laughs> the Supreme Court. So I was talking about the author. Uh, J. Sai Deepak is an engineer turned litigator practicing as an arguing counsel primarily before the Supreme Court of India and the High Court of Delhi. A mechanical engineer from Anna University, he graduated with bachelor's degree in law from IIT Kharagpur. Uh, sorry, IIT Kharagpur's law school in 2009 and has carved a niche for himself as a litigator in civil, commercial and constitutional matters. In 2019, he was awarded the Young Alumni Achievers Award by his alma mater IIT Kharagpur. Apart from delivering lectures on the constitutional issues, he is a prolific writer for leading newspapers and magazines. India, Bharat and Pakistan, the second book of the Bharat trilogy, takes the discussion forward from its best-selling predecessor, India, that is Bharat. That was the first book that came in, in 2021, and that was also a huge bestseller. <laughs> yeah. And now, can I just request uh, our panelists, Dr. Manakshi Jain, Dr. Anand Rangnathan, and J. Sain Deepak Ji, to please unveil the uh, book, release the book.
Thank you so much for that. Now, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Dr. Anand Rangnathan for the rest of the evening for the panel discussion. Good evening. Thank you so much, uh, Sai and uh, Dr. Jain. Uh, and uh, I apologize for uh, coming a bit late, but getting the visa from JNU to Delhi was a bit difficult. So. <laughs> And this is, the crowd is just astonishing. It just tells you the kind of rock star JSI is. And um, and it's kind of, uh, not at all, not. And it's kind of intimidating if this was a real courtroom. Can you imagine <laughs> if he was uh, you know, fighting a case and I am in the dock guilty already? Um, and nowadays, Sai is quite unlike a lot of lawyers we see on television and on Twitter. Uh, and uh, I mean, they say, that, you know, law is an ass, but those lawyers are actually asses, it's not. And uh, I'm sure their clients must be telling their, uh, uh, you know, the courthouse judges, ki, my lord, I have seen Twitter on Twitter, I will fight a case. I don't want to be represented. But uh, Sai is an absolute exception. It's, it's such a pleasure to see someone, first of all, from the field of STEM, uh, you know, venturing into something uh, which I would like to believe comes closest to STEM, uh, a non-STEM subject, I law coming closest to STEM, STEM, STEM subject. Um, and again, uh, you know, the, the first book set the, the whole pace for, I think, the next 10 years of what Sai intends all of us to read and write about. And I think that, that's really, uh, that, that's a, uh, uh, I, I, I would say he's actually uh, crossed a Rubicon in that. Not many people managed to do that. So um, really, uh, congratulations, Sai, on that account. And coming back to this, because I'd like, there, there's so many people, and I had told Sai that I'd like as many questions from the audience as possible. Um, and uh, from Minakshi ji as well. So I'd like to keep it very brief and jump straight into the questions. But uh, before I do, uh, I, I would, of course, like uh, to make a few comments on this book uh, and uh, request Minakshi ji to also do that and Sai to do that. And then we will go into the round of questions. If it's all right by the, yeah, yeah. Uh, this thing's fine, yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, that much well versed with this whole topic, I must admit. Um, my knowledge of this uh, till uh, or before today was limited to two books. I'll come to those uh, uh, in a minute. But the way uh, we scientists try to um, look for things is to look for things that are complementary to each other. So if you look at DNA, you have A, which is complementing T, G, which is complementing C. You look at proteins, you look at proteins interacting with each other. Uh, and same is the case with books as well. Very rarely do you find, especially nonfiction books, that stand alone. Um, by that, what I mean is that you have this huge bolus of knowledge uh, that you have learned from one book. And what you then search for, obviously, if it's a great book, you're, you, you are disappointed that the book's finished. You're always looking for something that comes to that mark, i.e., you want something to either complement that or to increase your knowledge in that subject. Before today, my knowledge of this subject was from two books. One was Ambedkar's uh, Pakistan and the Partition of India which is an absolute remarkable book, and everyone should read it. It should be a compulsory reading if, um, I don't know if 
our uh, education minister. Uh, I don't know why it has brought out uh, smiles and laughter the moment I talk about. <laughs> I've got nothing to do with that, except to say that, uh, uh, you know, more than commas should be changed now. It is time that we change more than commas. And one book that should be recommended reading, uh, one is, of course, the, the Black Book of Communism. Um, and the other is, should be um, Ambedkar's book on partition in Pakistan. Because it really, uh, it's one of those books that define the whole subject. And uh, the other book that, of course, I would know of is by Venkat Dhulipala, which is uh, Creating a New Medina. Absolutely remarkable book. So uh, what I would like to say is that before today, these were the two defining books on, in this genre. And after today, uh, I'm going to add Sai's book to that. So <laughs> it, it really is that important. Not so much as that it repeats what Ambedkar or Venkat have written. It doesn't. To a, to a great extent, it doesn't. What it does is it, like all great books do, they add to the knowledge. They don't repeat what's been said before. And I think it, it truly is, a, if, I can, if I can be a bit more partial, um, I don't know how the publishers would take it, but uh, this is way better than your first book, uh, Sai. And I, I'm dreading the trilogy because I don't want any book to be better than this. But uh, knowing you, I, I suppose the, the third one would be better than this. But, that, that, is, that is the mark that this book has made in my mind, that it has now, uh, I, I would say it ranks with the other two, Ambedkar's book and Venkert's book. And the reason why I say this is, and the reason why I think these three should be required reading is my question to Sai. Uh, Sai, uh, Ambedkar brought out in his book, um, in crystal clear vision, if I can call it that, that they really are what Sir Sayed was talking about. Of course, you cannot talk about races, but he talked about Muslims and Hindus being two antagonistic races. It's almost like two groups. And Ambedkar had the same thesis, but he brought it out with proof that yes, race, of course, is the same. There is one human race. Um, um, I also include Rahul Gandhi in that. But, um, <laughs> no, I, I, I do, I do. Uh, and, uh, but uh, what Ambedkar did was with meticulous examples upon examples upon, uh, you know, uh, things gleaned from the scriptures and from the speeches of all those great Maulanas and Muslim intellectuals, he really buttressed and reinforced this point that they really are two groups. And you don't even have to go to Islamic scriptures and talk about Dar al-Harb, Dar al-Islam to, to see that it is actually a fact. The unity is astonishing. And what Venkat did was slowly talk about that rather than it being partition being sudden, it was a meticulously planned out thought process. It was meticulously planned by the Maulanas who stayed back in India. It was meticulously, meticulously planned by the AMU intellectual whole group and then they stayed back. So how much of those two books, if I may say so, influenced your thinking? And uh, was it by design that I find this book to be very different in terms of the information that it has compared to the other two books? Okay. So uh, thank you, first of all, for turning up in such huge numbers. And uh, I'm bound to be accused of deliberately booking a small venue to give the impression that there's a lot of crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> but this was not the case. This was the best we could get, because it seems like the other venues are taken. Uh, but thank you so much. And thanks to the students for uh, treating this like a part shala. Grateful. And with Dr. Jain here, I think this is the way to go about it. All of us are actually sitting at our feet and learning. So. Uh, thanks to Justice Ramasubramaniam for having made it here, uh, and from, for members of the legal fraternity for having taken time out of their schedules to come here. I can see a lot of familiar faces here. To answer uh, Anand's question, 
I consciously tried not to be influenced by Dr. Ambedkar's book whatsoever. Uh, and I did use Venkat Dholipal as a reference to the first book as well as to the second book. But there's a significant distinction, and I'll explain why. Venkat Dhulipala's book effectively starts from the 1937 session. I think it's the Lahore session that he refers to. And he traces and charts the genesis of Pakistan from 1937. And Dr. Ambedkar effectively looks at it more from the perspective of Sayyid Ahmad Khan with a cursory reference to the Islamic invasions. But the mindset does not get the kind of expansive treatment that it deserves. And therefore, what I've done as part of this book is to go back to the fall of the Mughal Empire, the decline of the Mughal Empire, uh, after the sack of Delhi by Nadir Shah in 1739. And the fundamental question that I've asked myself is, has the loss of state power resulted in loss of consciousness as far as a particular group is concerned? Or have they managed to reinvent themselves and come out through multiple movements? Because you see, whenever you talk of Pakistan, the earliest we are able to go to is Syed Ahmad Khan. But Syed Ahmad Khan himself is the product of a larger movement and merely one representative of one particular strand of thought in that particular movement. That he had, that he was the product of a particular seminary, which is based out of Delhi which is called madrasa e rahimiya which is where I think the history of Bharat takes a very crucial turn from 1740 onwards. The history of that particular seminary coupled with the kind of individuals that were produced by it, along with all the movements that each of them gave birth to, at least six movements post, I'd say, the fall of the Wahhabi movement were given birth to by people who were disciples of that particular seminary. Syed Ahmad Khan was but one of the disciples. And therefore, you end up knowing more about him simply because he established an institution called the Aligarh Muslim University. But beyond that, there is not much to be understood. So which is exactly why what I've done is, if Venkat Dhulipala starts from 1937, my book ends in December 1924. So I am actually showing that the thought and the beach and the seed of Pakistan has come into existence well before 1937, at least by December 1924. But the germ for that particular seed and the thought process started in 1740 at the very least. That is the thesis of this particular book. And therefore, the only perhaps similarity between my book and Dr. Ambedkar's approach is that both of us speak like lawyers through this book, which is to say, if this is the position, where is the evidence to support it and back it up? That's it. So most of the book covers that. But since this is a continuum as far as the previous book is concerned, how do you relate both the books? The first book effectively looks at the Christian European line, starting from, let's say, Christopher Columbus onwards until the first Government of India Act of 1919. In chapter six of that book, I've already hinted at the possibility of a different scope, where I've spoken of Middle Eastern coloniality in chapter six of the first book. But since that concept was merely touched upon and not given sufficient treatment, I realized that it would make no sense whatsoever not to discuss it further, because you are not going to be able to discuss the Constitution without touching upon partition, and partition was not an overnight development. In which case, the central question that I would end up asking myself is, did the partition make any difference to the thought process of the Constituent Assembly when they were discussing the Constitution? The Constituent Assembly effectively comes into existence in May 1946. When did direct action day take place? 16th August 1946. So while the Constituent Assembly was discussing the Samvidhan, people were being butchered left, right and center in Bengal and Punjab. So were you even cognizant of the motivations behind this? That the two-nation theory was actually playing itself out on the ground while you were discussing this constitution? This is the question that I'm trying to ask. The other, let's say, question that I'm trying to take a serious pot shot at and hoping to bust it completely is, every time we discuss the partition of Bharat, allow me to be blunt here, which is the stupidest answer that is given is the British did this thanks to their divide and rule policy as if everybody else was innocent. Now, you're dealing with adults. So if someone is dividing and ruling you, clearly there is a pre-existing division that he is taking advantage of. 
So the point that I'm trying to make here is he did not create a division, he merely exploited a pre-existing division which outlasted their advent by at least a thousand years. And therefore, I'm trying to ask myself, did they actually consciously collaborate with each other to lead towards the partition? Was there a conscious handshake between the British mindset and let's say the Shah Waliullah Dehlavi mindset? This is the question that I'm asking. And I have come to the conclusion that you must read the book. <laughs> so, as far as I'm concerned, Dr. Ambedkar's analysis was more from the perspective of whether the eventuality of Pakistan can be done away with, can it be stalled, can it be prevented, because he published his book in 1946. Similarly, India Divided is a book that's published by uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad which is also referred to in this book. And all of them are trying to publish literature to say, no, the two-nation theory doesn't work. So Dr. Ambedkar accepts the two-nation theory. Rajan Prasad says the two-nation theory doesn't work. It doesn't exist. It's a, it's a figment of imagination. So all those works were looked at. But since the analysis of that consciousness which drives this entire movement was missing in Dr. Ambedkar's book, I thought it's, a, it's an important gap to be filled up. So think of it this way, the Christian line, European line comes in the first book, the second book brings both the Islamic line as well as the Christian line and then they merge. Once they have merged, from December 1924, how do they move forward? And by December 1924, was it clear to the so-called leaders of our independence movement that you are staring at a, a formidable alliance which is working to the detriment of the native consciousness? In the process of this analysis, what I've also done is examined truly what is the so-called independence movement? Were we even asking for independence in the first place? When did the question actually come about? And who should be given credit for it rightly so is the question that I'm asking. The marginalized group of the independence movement, the revolutionaries, how much they were single-handedly responsible for pushing the collaborators of the British to take a pro-independence position is a question that I'm asking in this book. So these are the broad questions that I've raised. And I'm also trying to consciously take down certain icons who have been valorized for no reason and to the detriment of our own understanding and our own, let's say, understanding of history. So there is a conscious attempt to use the literature to say, perhaps some people are under focus beyond necessary and some people who should have been given their due, who were literally giving their lives not in, let's say, five-star jails, but in, let's say, the, in, in torture cells and in Kalapani and whatnot. Namaste. Please, Mr. Sanyal Sia. Deserve. And since I spoke of revolutionaries from Bengal, I think his entry is uh, apt. <laughs> So he's just landed in Delhi. He's been kind enough to show up. Thank you, Dada. Thank you so much. So these are the different issues that I've tried to address. And the other thing that I'm also asking myself is, are we in the midst of a repeat of history? Whether, because this is not an academic exercise whatsoever. If the first book was relatively academic because I'm raising certain fundamental theoretical questions, the practicals and the demonstration has started in the second book. Effectively saying, now that I have given certain theoretical questions, let's start the work. Which is to say, apply it and ask yourself whether you can draw a one-on-one -on -one correspondence between what happened in the 1920s and what's happening currently. These are the fundamental questions. So the long answer to your short question is, while they were certain benchmarks, they were benchmarks from the perspective of what they have not covered so that this forms an additional corpus that people can read along with it. In that sense, uh, as a student of history, I found Venkat Dhulipala's book much more rigorous and way more prescient from the perspective of predicting what could happen. Because I don't think Venkat Dhulipala's exercise was archival in nature. He wasn't merely examining past. So in that sense, I would say that Venkat Dhulipala's work has influenced me more than perhaps Dr. Ambedkar's. Because Dhulipala has the luxury of examining more material. He is not looking at the specter of partition. It's not 1946. So he has been able to collect better material in that sense. So that would be the long answer to the short question. Yeah. Thanks very much, Sai. Uh, can you hear me? It's
You know, uh, Sai talked about that he has consciously tried to uh, bring down some icons or false icons. Bring down, you know, bulldozer chala diya hai unhone. Yogi would be proud. Let me give you a few, I mean, I, I have made a few notes on when he talks about the collusion between the Maulanas or the Muslims and the British. Uh, let me, I mean, I made, for simplicity sake, some bullet points on Sir Syed, who is one of the biggest icons you can think of. Uh, these are his quotes. The 1857 revolt was an act of haram zadgi. Uh, for those not very well versed with uh, Hindi, it, it's uh, bastardliness. The Mohammedans did not contemplate jihad against the Christians. Those who did were vagabonds and ill-conditioned men. To be faithless to one's salt is to disregard the first principles of our religion. Loyalty to the British is the religious duty of Muslims. This is Sir Sayyid, the venerated Sir Sayyid. You, i.e. Muslims, are only justified in fighting the British if they actively prevent you from exercising your Islamic faith. We Mohammedans, and this is very interesting, the last one before I uh, move. We Mohammedans live in this country with every sort of religious liberty. We read our azans as loud as we wish. We can preach our faith on public roads. This is Sir Sayyid saying, so this is not under Modi government. Uh, we make converts of Christians and Hindus to Islam without any fear of prohibition. Why should we worry the British? And why should the British worry us? So a lot of icons, not just a few, have been brought down in this magnificent book. Uh, before I uh, turn to Minakshi ji for what she has to say about this, um, just for spicing up things, I also have a Twitter question for you, because let's not disregard your, your Twitter army, which is uh, multifold more massive than this one. And I will take a question from here. So the Twitter question is, um, I think it's quite a deep question, depending on how you look at it. It says, uh, why have you kept the color of this book as the color that you have kept? <laughs> Is it in any relation to Pakistan or not? So that's the question. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. So think of it as a color play in the sense that because there is a significant degree of uh, exposition on Pakistan. People are bound to relate the combination of green and white to uh, Pakistan. However, one of the things that I did with the first book was to reclaim the color blue, which is associated with a certain movement today. Similarly, the idea is to reclaim the color green. So when, uh, let's say, the Tiranga was being uh, conceived of, if you ask the Mathadipatis of Hindu Mathas, their entire position was, green represents Durga, uh, white represents knowledge and therefore it is Saraswati, and uh, I think the saffron represents Lakshmi from what I understand. I could be wrong, but this was effectively their reading of it. Now. Therefore, I wanted to bust the myth that a particular color belongs to a particular community, but if at all it belongs to any particular community, well, we are the oldest, so most colors belong to us. Okay. So, that is one. I don't know how many people have paid attention to the representation of Tripura Sundarima. She is always in a green sari, typically in a green sari. So, that's where the color comes from. And if, while I don't mention it expressly in the book, the last three or four lines of the acknowledgement make it abundantly clear because there's a direct reference to Durgama. And secondly, the color green represents fertility, growth, and abundance. And therefore, allow me to use the leftist parlance here, the only way to counter utterly toxic patriarchal masculinity <laughs> is to surrender to the divine feminine. And therefore, you, you, 
forgot Brahminical. Oh, sorry, Brahminical. No, but they are not Brahminical, no? <laughs> so, the entire point was to say that any identity that chooses to assert itself by crushing the divine, divine feminine under its foot fears being defeated by the divine feminine. There is a deep-seated insecurity which I think needs to be exploited and used to the hilt. No wonder Isis was running scared of the Pashmarga, primarily ladies, right? So I think that was one exhortation here. Second, I think I've said this on Arihan's channel, Vad, that the boundaries of the sacred civilization and its sacred geography are defined by the extent and the place, uh, let's say the location of our temples. So here I'm basically looking at uh, Kshir Bhavani, Dhakeshwari, uh, Hinglaj Mata, Kanyakumari. That's it. That's the representation. Wonderful. Thank you. And green is a wonderful color. And Isis color is black, so that's not uh, uh, so I've been given this wonderful uh, sheaf of um, questions that audience have asked. So uh, is Apratim, Apratim there? Ap Apratim? Yes, I'll, so one question from there, then I'll come to ma'am, and then I'll... Apratim? Yes. Oh, there is, yeah. So uh, you want to, you remember the question that you put here, or should I? Okay, so please ask your question, yeah. Uh, hey. Oh, should I? Okay, all right. Oh, right, right. It, okay, so I've been asked to ask what you asked, right? In case I make an error, please don't sue me. Nowadays, zamana bada kharaab hai. That's true, yes. And there's a Reverend uh, Justice here as well. So. So I'll, I'll have the lawyer, I'll have the court audience, and I'll have the judge as well. <laughs> what more do I need? Uh, so Apratim asks, respected sir, the forces responsible for our vivisection haven't yet disappeared. In fact, they have re-armored themselves according to the new constitutional setup with new lexicons and methodology. How do we counter this new enemy? I think that's the nub of the book, that's the sum and substance and the gist of the book. Which is to say when someone says that two nation theory's existence came to an end with the creation of Pakistan, then you'd, you fail to understand the reason for the use of the word coloniality. The reason for the use of the word coloniality is, not, is that it's not an exercise in dissecting the past, but a continuing experience which we continue to experience till date whether it's the European form of coloniality or the Middle Eastern form of coloniality. So therefore, the question before us is that how do you look at those labels? What are the labels, the politically correct labels and the constitutionally acceptable labels under which the two nation theory currently operates? Can it be said that the majority minority framework is a restatement of the two nation theory? Can it be said that the minority victim hood card that is constantly played is a direct reflection and a, let's say a successor of the two nation theory? These are the questions that I seek to address but not through rhetoric at all. I'm connecting as many dots as possible. So that's what I try to present in the book. Now how do we counter them? You will find the answer to this perhaps I think in chapter one at the end of the chapter I've answered about, I've given about five or six pointers. In terms of how should the society and the state partner to effectively deal with this particular issue uh, or a challenge so to speak, because I don't think the society alone can do it and I don't think the state alone can do it. What kind of a division of intellectual prowess and what kind of an investment does it call for both on the part of the state and the society? I've asked those questions and I've tried to answer those questions. Finally, what I've also done, is to fundamentally uh, make the argument that if, let's say, the filters which are imposed by the left were to be removed from the discourse, which are meant and designed and intended to gag an honest conversation and, uh, let's say, an exercise in truth, reconciliation hoga ya nahi hoga, ye to upar wale ke hai, but at least the truth, that I basically said that let those filters be removed from the conversation. 
and then let's see where the conversation goes. And whether the other side is even open to acknowledging the atrocities of the past and the continuing atrocities of the present, like for instance in Hyderabad and other places today. So to the best of my understanding, it starts with first of all vocalizing your position. And to be able to grow a spine to vocalize your position is the first step in taking, let's say, a step towards addressing the problem. Without that, it's not going to happen. Most people end up asking people like you, me, and Sanjeevji and others, Kitab kya ho jayega? What is the point? What is the point? It is an articulation, a cohesive articulation of a certain position. Because you can have certain random thoughts, somebody else can have random thoughts, but who's going to connect this and then say, this is the final position as it, as it is meant to be articulated. That is where I think these contributions are coming from. So I would think of, let's say, Vikramji's work, or Mr. Sanyal's work, or your daily AK-47 firing on television, okay? <laughs> All of this is a step in that particular direction. That pehle lo apne andar bolne ki to read ki haddi paaye, uske baad jo hoga dekha jayega. Once you start vocalizing it, that's the first, digger, let's say, level of pushback or resistance that you offer. Because they operate under the basis that you will not be able to muster the guts to speak out of the fear of ostracization, marginalization, branding, labeling, silencing, stifling, everything that scholars such as Dr. Jain have faced in all their decades of work. The idea is to change that status quo first, and from there we will see what, let's say, solutions emerge. That's uh, basically the position. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sai. Does that answer your question, Apritam? Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, Sai mentioned Hyderabad today, uh, another sad day because uh, uh, Sir Tan Se Juda slogans have been raised against one BJP MLA, uh, Raja Singh. He's been arrested and he's been sus suspended by the BJP. So uh, that was the reference to Hyderabad. And you mentioned chapter one. Yes. Uh, whenever someone mentions chapter, <laughs> next is worse, Konsa, but. <laughs> it was Akhir Nayak. Uh. But uh, in incidentally, chapter 98, verse six, you are the worst of creatures. But uh, <laughs> yeah. can I now please have the pleasure of requesting Minakshi ji? Um, <laughs> Congratulations, Sai, for such a tremendous work. Uh, there's very little left to be said on this subject. It is so comprehensive. But since I'm a historian, and there's such a large, young audience over here, I would like to place certain issues before them which will help in clarifying the situation. You know, you've talked about Middle Eastern coloniality. My study of history shows me that this Middle Eastern coloniality had its advent in India at the moment the first Muslim state was set up, that is the Delhi Sultanate in 1206. And I'm just going to make five, six points about Middle Eastern coloniality vis-a-vis -vis the political setup, vis-a-vis -vis the economic setup, vis-a-vis -vis the language setup, and vis-a-vis the cultural setup. So just uh, be a little patient. Uh, when the Sultanate was established in 1206, the entire cabinet consisted of among 40 Turks. So this was such a closed political system. And this remained a closed system till the time of the Khaljis, when there was a revolt and a new batch of people came from Khalaj in Afghanistan, so that is the next thing. And in the time of the Sayyids, about 22 Afghan families shared all the political posts among themselves. So Middle Eastern coloniality, as far as the political setup in Delhi is concerned, begins with the advent of the first Muslim state in India. Now, I'll just quickly come to the Mughals, Babur, when he came to India, he brought with him two groups of people. One were the Iranis from Iran, and the other were the Central Asians or Turanis. The entire ministry was dominated only by these two groups. There was no question of accommodating or giving space to any Indian Muslim or Rajput or whoever. Humayun, he was exiled. When he came back, he came with more foreign groups. 
and they controlled the polity. Things began to change in the time of Akbar because, you know, he was a young boy and he was all the time threatened with revolts by other foreign groups who said we are from more distinguished families, why should we not sit on the throne of Hindustan? That is when Akbar realized that all the weight is on, of the scales is on one side, Taraju, and we must have some weight on the other side. So the intelligent person that he was, he chose two groups. One is the Rajputs and the other is the Indian Muslims. Indian Muslims because no foreign Muslim is going to choose them as their leader. And Rajputs because they were sword arm of Hindu society. So the composition of the ruling class in the Mughal period remained 70% foreign born Muslims and 30%, 15% Rajputs and 15% uh, Indian Muslims. This remained unchanged, virtually unchanged till the reign of Aurangzeb, and why it remained unchanged, we can discuss that later. But when the Mughal Empire went into decline, this is very, very surprising. It talks about coloniality. The Mughal Emperor had to appoint governors at three important provinces of India, Awadh, which we call UP today, Bengal, and Hyderabad. And whom did he appoint in Awadh? an Iranian who had come to India in 1708 and in 1722 was made in charge of the important province of Awadh and after that we know what happened in Awadh. The same thing in Bengal. It's interesting because in Bengal there was a young Brahmin boy in the Deccan and one Iranian nobleman adopted him, converted him to his faith and he served in various posts in the Mughal Empire. Then this Iranian went back to Iran and when he died, this convert Muslim came to India in 1699. In 1700, Aurangzeb appointed him governor of the Deccan. There is no question, I mean, this coloniality, people are coming in the 18th century and getting the top post. And in Hyderabad, the person who was appointed governor, his father had come in the time of Shah Jahan and they said, we are the descendants of Abu Bakr, the Caliph. So this mindset continues. This is just one aspect. Then I want to talk about the economic coloniality. You see, in the Mughal state, the entire revenue was coming from agriculture. In the Hindu system, it was that the ruler should tax the peasant as much as a bee extracts honey from a flower, it should not hurt that flower. But in the Mughal state, the land tax was almost the entire produce of the peasant. And we have so many foreign travelers coming and discussing and describing the state of the peasantry and the peasantry are exploited. They try to run away from their fields. The Mughal state tries to bring them back. But that apart, this entire surplus of the countryside it was distributed in the Mughal state among 1,600 people only. The entire surplus was distributed among 1,600 people. And as we've discussed, they were relatives of the emperor, foreign nobility, etc. And this nobility, they, each member of the nobility or the ruling class had to keep soldiers for the state. Even if you were a writer like Abul Fazl, you had to keep a minimum number of soldiers for the state. So, 1,600 people, they spent 50% of their income on maintaining the troops. And Akbar spent another 10% on maintaining the troops. That means 60% of the resources of the empire were spent on maintaining an armed force at a time when India faced no external threat. So what, this is coloniality, and we talk about the British, they took away. This was just conspicuous consumption. The village got nothing in return. So that is the second point. Now to come to the cultural point. Akbar, whom we refer so much, he was the first person who said Persian will be the language of administration at all levels. And even the village Patwari, who kept the revenue records, had to learn Persian. Now, how do you overnight learn Persian? 
Akbar first of all imported many Iranians from Iran and he revised the madrasa curriculum so that Khatris and Kayas could learn the language fast. So this is uh, when we talk, you know, when we compare uh, Middle Eastern coloniality with the British, this is an important aspect which we have not paid attention to. Now, when, so that means Persian derived its power only from the state. When the Mughal Empire went into decline, that Persian language did not have the support of the state. So what was the alternative? A new language had to be devised. The natural language that should have been chosen was Hindavi. It was the naturally evolving language. But what was the problem in Hindavi? It was that it had a large number of Sanskrit words. So the Mughal uh, intellectual class, they removed Sanskrit words, substituted them for Arab and Persian words, and that gave birth to Urdu. The Mughals never patronized a native language. And uh, in this context, I just want to make one point. You know, they had Sanskrit scholars who would come to the court, but in the Persian records, they are never mentioned as Sanskrit scholars. They're only mentioned as singers who came to the court, sang before the emperor, and took money and went away in the most derogatory manner. And Last point, and after that I'll just make one more point, architecture. It was the rule in the Mughal period that every lane, by-lane highway should be dominated only by mosques. And the religious structures of every other site, were, of every other group were pushed away from public view. Man Singh, who was a friend of Akbar, he was made governor of Rotas. And in Rotas, he bought a lot of land. He wanted to build a big temple there. Then this friend of the emperor, he gets frightened that if I build a temple over here, emperor will get angry. So he, Man Singh, builds a mosque over there and the small temple at the side. In his home state of Ambar, he wanted to build the Jagat Shrimani temple in honor of his young son who had passed away. And again, it is in the back lane. If you're passing through that road, you will not even know that there's a temple there. So this, you know, this coloniality that you just brush aside, this is such a painful uh, part of our history. And we talk about uh, Mughal Rajput marriage alliances as a Ganga Jamna Tehzeeb. The Mughals always prided themselves in their Turkic ancestry. They said we are the descendants of Timur. They've never mentioned their, that Rajput blood also flow on their veins. And this is a story that we find on both sides. The Rajput texts that were written in the medieval period, they did not mention the alliances, marriage alliances with Mughals. And Mughals did not mention the marriage alliances with the Rajputs. Uh, Man Singh in, and all the Rajput rulers, one point that I want to make, all the Rajput rulers, who became part of the Mughal system, each of them was very worried that how will posterity remember us? So in their own kingdoms, they got their court historians to present their view of the Mughal Rajput alliance. So uh, a, a Man Charit, a Mughal um, uh, a history that was written in Man Singh's court, does not mention that his grandfather gave a daughter in marriage to Akbar. So, you know, it, I mean, to say that it was Ganga Jamna Tezib, it is to ignore what a contested memory we have of that period. And, uh, you know, so-called uh, secular intellectuals, they are just trying to whitewash this painful episode of our past. This is something, a series of histories were written in every Rajput court contesting what the Mughals were presenting at this thing. So, you know, uh, I mean, I'll stop over here, but it is important to remember this counter narrative when we talk about coloniality. And uh, Sai has made a very, very important contribution to Middle Eastern coloniality. But I think that these kind of facets, they will help the younger generation to argue. 
you did not uh, allow Hindi, you impose Persian. With Persian, you impose a Persian culture, a Persian language, a Persian tradition. So, you know, and you never gave representation to anyone. And uh, Jagannath Pandit, he was a very, very renowned scholar. And uh, he is never referred to as a, we would not know that he was a Sanskrit scholar if we referred to only the Persian texts, you know. And just last point, that this whole debate about jazia and pilgrimage tax, this also needs to be re-examined. In the time of Shah Jahan, there was a very important Sanskrit scholar, uh, Kabindacharya. He came to Shah Jahan's court and successfully made the emperor remove the pilgrimage tax to all Hindus going on pilgrimage to Prayag and Allahabad. Now, if Akbar had removed the thing and that had become effective, why did these people have to come to Shah Jahan? And in the Mughal Persian accounts, this is not mentioned at all, that Shah Jahan removed this tax because Shah Jahan was very conscious of his image as a proud, good Muslim. So, you know, and we know about this only because the Hindu writers, they felicitated him and they honored him. But there are two contrasting worldviews and two contrasting thought traditions that are existing side by side in the entire medieval period. And I have not found any evidence of them uh, meeting each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minakshi ji. And here is a blistering example of how in 10 minutes, Minakshi ji has completely busted the myth that, uh, yes, Babar might have been an invader, but way down the line, Aurangzeb wasn't, Akbar wasn't. I mean, it's, uh, it's really fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Minakshi ji, for... And th that, is the, that is the power of factual accounts. And I uh, always believe that there is only one truth. There are no versions of truth, you know. So you have a lot of, um, I don't know how many leftists are there in this audience, but uh, <laughs> and they uh, misreport. So if tomorrow there is a report in Wire or Scroll or some other, this thing, the three bigots were sitting here. <laughs> And they were talking nonsense about this. And Mughals are our heritage. And you know, Bhai Chara, Ganga Jamna. As Pushpendra says, Pata lagao, Bhai kone, Chara kone. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, I'll take your question in the end. I, I want another one of audience's question. Uh, Smita. Smita Jaiswal's question. Smita is around? There, that's Smita? OK, so I'm going to, because you're too far off, but that, that is Smita. Her question is, uh, sir, how should we deal with people who still choose not to address the issue of the ongoing process of Indic identity erosion? And how should we make them realize about the wrongful things that are happening? Because apparently for them, I sound like some extremist, which I'm not. This is she is saying, I'm not saying that. Um, sorry. So I think what has happened over the last few years, at least I'd say since 2019, if not 2014, is the proliferation of serious literature and scholarly literature that is trying to present facts before the public is mounting pressure on the state to get its act together as far as history is concerned. Now, it is my belief after having seen whatever I have since 2014, that perhaps the political system only responds to a system of incentives. And therefore, if we were to belabor under the impression that ideology is always going to prevail, I am not discounting the presence of ideology. I am merely saying that the composition of that mindset may be about 50% ideology and 50% incentive. And I am being very, very charitable in this particular regard, saying that it's even 50%. Therefore, I think it is important for the civil society 
to take upon itself to press the right buttons to make sure that its voices are heard. If at all there is any repetitive sentiment or late motive in all the talks that I have given and the public interactions that I have undertaken since 2016, it is to ask the society to at least be much more vocal about its interests than outsourcing this entire activity to the state. When you manage to, let's say, produce intellectuals like Mr. Sanyal, Sampath and everybody else, what you end up doing is that you're trying to create a critical mass of chorus in the heart of the society, which should hopefully translate to articulation of political interests at a later point. So one, therefore, it tells you that an investment in academic is not academic per se. It is an investment in policy, it is an investment in understanding history, not revisionism of history, but an understanding of history, revisitation of history and its re-examination. Two, uh, my experience on college campuses has been that students across the board, at least in several DU colleges, are very, very keen on seeing a change in the curricula in their life and time while they're on campus. Every time I go there, this is the question that I've been asked. A show of hands uh, with people who agree with me on this. Any students of DU? There it is. Every time. And I think in Hansraj, I had a, a girl student, a female no, student. The curriculum will change the moment BJP gets a majority. So that's <laughs> <laughs> Super majority. 543 out of 543. So, uh, one of the female students ended up asking me this brilliant question. We are ready and we are willing to support this change against all allegations of saffronization, Sanghi Karan and Bhagwa Karan and all that. When we are willing to support it, why doesn't the government, let, let's say, trust its own support base when it comes to this, having come to power twice with fantastic majorities despite the opposition and not because of the opposition? So there I think perhaps a certain degree of chintan must go uh, as far as the state is concerned. No, uh, absolutely. And if I can add to that, uh, in fact, I have a bit of note as well. You see, uh, our governments are always concerned with opening the eyes of people who are pretending that their eyes are closed. Unki aankhe wo khola ni chate aur hamari aankhe khuli nahi hai. And I'll tell you the biggest example of that. The author of a book is sitting right here, Sanjeev Sanyal, very good friend. For all, practically all my life, uh, yeah, I was about to say all my life of 30 years, but obviously it's <laughs> more than that. I believe that after Ashoka undertook the Kalinga war and he killed a million odd people, he saw the destruction, he was so distraught and he said, what have I done being a Hindu? I co convert to Buddhism. That's wrong. Sanjeev shows that he was already a Buddhist for four years before he undertook the Kalinga war. Now that is something that I want to hunt for the guy who gave me that false narrative. I, I want to really, I don't know, I'm a non-violent man by nature. <laughs> but, you know, something that has stayed with me for 40 years and stayed with, I would say, 99% of people. Ki bhai, itna destruction usne kiya, fir usne itna usko bura laga, and he said, oh, I have to convert, I can't see all this thing. Just imagine what people would think what Hinduism is and what Buddhism is. And the fact is he was already a Buddhist. These are the things that, uh, you know, we've been, not been taught, and I'll give you one example. Meenakshi ji mentioned about Persian. Do you know every Hindu king used to use Persian in his seal? It was uh, this thing. One king said, I'm going to change it. Can you name that king? Chhatrapati Shivaji. Before that, all Hindu kings also used to use Persian. And I went to... And I went to Pune and uh, uh, you had Rawat Dada and he showed me that see it was really one of the most thrilling experiences I have. Incidentally a museum that is um, hopefully the government would do something well. Okay, not the government but some philanthropist could do something because it's really run down and they are so eager, they are so excited about their collection. But unfortunately, you know, it is at such a place where no visitor comes. It was really a remarkable place. But coming back to Shivaji, and coming back to the kind of history we've been taught and the historians we've been eulogizing, uh, I shouldn't take the name, but uh, what the hell, uh, Ram Guha. Uh, you, know, you know the time, I think five or seven years ago when Aurangzeb Road was renamed, incidentally to Abdul Kalam, 
So obviously it wasn't renamed to Savarkar Patani, uh, explosion would have happened. Um, but even then there was so much of protest. And Ram Guha wrote an article on why it should not be renamed or there should be no Delhi road renamed after Chhatrapati Shivaji. So he was not only protesting that Aurangzeb road is being renamed, he was crying buckets, he was saying no road should be renamed or named on Chhatrapati Shivaji. And he, these are the three reasons that he gave, these celebrated historians. These are the three reasons why the renaming of New Delhi roads after figures such as Shivaji is a mistaken idea. The first is that it shall feed into the majoritarianism that has become a creepingly dangerous presence in our body politic. So you can forgive that, Guha have uh, chalega. Uh, anybody is free to have his opinion. Uh, and coming from JNU, I know what all these opinions are worth. <laughs> A second and more important reason not to honor the likes of Shivaji in India's capital city is that he was essentially a regional figure. The man who birthed an empire from Plassey, from Peshawar to Plassey is being called a regional, regional figure. These expressions of Maratha pride make some sense in regional contexts, less so in the capital of our large and diverse country. The third and indeed, the most important reason why we should resist the renaming of New Delhi streets after Shivaji is that he was a lord in an age of feudalism, endorsed wild caste hierarchies and consolidated scriptural and social practices which led to the subordination of women. He is talking of Aurangzeb, eulogizing Aurangzeb and you know, talking like this of Shivaji and the coup d'etat is that they, when he wrote this article saying no road should be named Shivaji, there already exist three roads in Delhi named after Shivaji. So much for fact checking. But sorry. Uh, you know, you, uh, huh, yeah, there is. But you know, on this uh, question of textbooks, uh, I feel that the situation is pretty hopeless uh, because no, no. Uh, because what the government, first of all, the government has no clue how to go about it. They really are clueless about how to write history books. So what they have done is that they're reducing the content of history books in the NCRT books. And uh, one thing that I want to tell you that, you know, uh, the last textbooks which are still there, uh, what the JNU second generation of historians have done is that they have done away with chronology. So they have written history on the basis of themes and issues. So, you know, that civilizational memory that all of us have, that our uh, history begins with the Ved, you know, we say, Koi Ved mein likha hai. So they have just removed that and they begin with the Mahabharat. So there are so many insidious ways to destroy our living link with our heritage. But the only saving grace is the social network. You know, the people are just using that to write what they want. They write their own local histories. They are bypassing these established historians because they are not going to change. And I don't see the NCRT textbooks, at least, uh, producing something better. Because there is no clarity. What are we going to write? They don't know. I would not hear one word against JNU. Uh, <laughs> two, two or three maybe, but not one. Uh, no, but, uh, you know, l l let me ask this as a follow-up question, Sai, before I come to you again with another question. Uh, the fact is that we are now being branded Sanghi communal bigots, so that's why we can ask these questions freely. Uh, uh, given the combined population, let's be very honest about the, of the subcontinent, Muslim population, which would be approximately, I would say, 700 million or maybe more, Two questions here. Are you happy that Pakistan is separate from India? And two, uh, do you agree with Ambedkar? And I'm quoting Ambedkar here. The only effective way of solving the minorities problem is population exchange. Until that is done, even with the creation of Pakistan, the problem of majority versus minority will remain in India. Transfer of minorities is the only lasting remedy for communal peace. So let me first address the contentious question of whether partition was the only way forward. 
if you were to look at it purely from the perspective of territorial nationalism and security, you might end up saying yes. But there is something that I read during the course of the research of the second book, which made me wonder if we should revisit these notions. So one of the things that effectively recharged the Muslim community during the 1800s was, in fact, there are two things. One was the four-volume treatise written by William Muir on the Prophet, Islamic Prophet, not the Prophet, the Islamic Prophet. Second is a book written by W. W. Hunter called The Indian Muslims. Now, when he's talking of the Wahhabi movement as part of this particular uh, tome called The Indian Muslims, most of us today, as, I mean, associate the Swat Valley with the Taliban and everybody else, right? The reference in that book very clearly shows that the Swat Valley is apparently the place where Arjuna visited for Pashupatastra. That's called the Mahavan Mountains or something. Apparently, that's the name that's given to it. Now, therefore, if you were to ask me from the perspective of civilization nationalism, I will not be comfortable with any solution that requires me to yield even an inch of civilizational sacred space. Which means, maybe there are other ways to deal with the challenge without having to let go of that particular territory. And I think uh, last week or so, a particular snippet of Nehru cackling away to glory was released at the time of the signing of the partition, so to speak. That tells me the kind of myopia with which we, uh, uh, let's say, approach these issues. I am basically saying that if my Puranas and my Vedas and, let's say, and my Itihasas effectively tell me that these are the markers of my territory, then perhaps I may want to take a Jewish approach which says, whatever happens, this is my, the territory of my forefathers under any circumstances. And therefore, anybody else who wants to be in that particular place, will have to do so only if they respect these sentiments and if they respect that particular position. The escapist position is to say, let's partition, go away. Now what do you do when the next round of demographic imbalance happens? Partition some more, give it off. So that means Bengal is out, parts of Kerala are out, parts of Hyderabad are out, parts of Madhya Pradesh are out. So what do you have? A balkanized India? To put it in Jinnah's language, a moth-eaten, truncated Bharat, is that what you're looking at? The solution cannot be to say that the moment the demographic balance tilts against you or the scales are tipped against you, you choose to say, let's do away with this. Then what is the difference between that decision and Nehru's infamous statement at the time of the Indo-Sino War? Ladakh mein kya hai? There is not even a single blade of grass that grows, so let's give it up. Is that the way we see Ladakh then? Then what is our uh, assessment of Kailash Mansur over there? That's supposed to be one of the holiest of spots for us. So I would say, Population exchange coming from Dr. Ambedkar was the position more from, let's say he was a student of Eurocentric nation statism. So therefore he was looking at it more from the perspective of what would have happened in a, in a Europe when it comes to exchange of populations with respect to territories. That example cannot work in Bharat. Now, which, in which case the question would be then what do you do with the population? Well, I would say history will do whatever it has to. At the time of the partition, or close to 1924, you're looking at a 70 million population there. Seven crores was effectively the population of the community that was asking for Pakistan. Now, today you're looking at 10 times that figure. At the very least, you're looking at 700 million. Isn't that the figure then? You're looking at about 70 crores, right? Then, the question then would be, you can't just look at it from that perspective because then you're assuming that the rest of the Hindus are all conscious Hindus, which is not the case. I would say that the percentage of conscious Hindus in the Hindu population must be close to about 60% at best, and that's a very optimistic figure. In which case, some may not even have a problem with the balkanized Bharat. If people don't have a problem with the influx of illegal migrants, and they also say that the CA must include everybody who's, let's say, tormented in Pakistan, then such people would be equally comfortable with balkanization of Bharat, regardless of what is the fate of the Hindu community or the Hindu civilization. Again, therefore, I say the problem lies within. So I may not agree with Dr. Ambedkar's solution. The reason that we are looking at those solutions is because those who wanted to adopt other solutions were snubbed and stifled. Maybe they should have been given a shot. You know, you uh, and I'll, I'll come smoothly to this question that's been asked. But before that, uh, which is more important, a conscious Hindu or a conscious government? A conscious Hindu is less transient. A conscious government is more transient and expedient. 
and a conscious Hindu society is capable of creating its own universes. And one of the reasons that this book contributes directly to that answer is the revival of the Middle Eastern consciousness after the loss of state power through organization of the community by creating institutions that keep that memory alive and the consciousness alive is the single biggest lesson that you must take away from this entire experience. Because when someone says state power is the only thing, is the only solution, no, I'm sorry to say, your Ram Janabhumi movement started when you were nowhere in power. The Allahabad High Court judgment of 2010 was delivered when you were not in power. Shilanyas was forced, or let's say it was constrained to be performed by a so-called anti-Hindu government because the Hindu society was much more vocal about it. The question that you should be asking yourself is, assume for a moment that a pro-Hindu government continues to be in power for another 15, 20 years. Does it necessarily mean that the Hindu society is capable of repeating another Ram Janabhumi movement? No. The answer is a no. Can you repeat a Ram Janabhumi movement today with respect to Kashi and Mathura? Here's the open challenge. The answer is a no. So therefore, what is better? And ask yourself this simple question. The Ram Janabhumi movement was kept alive for 500 years because of a conscious Hindu society. The, your inability to recreate and repeat that particular experience is the single biggest defeat, notwithstanding the happiness or the joy that you draw from the fact that we are in power. Because you have ceded the societal space. Think of yourself in the mold of a Vishwamitra who says, I can create a parallel universe anytime I want, provided I have the intention and the conviction. And therefore, I would prefer a conscious Hindu society, which can work on its own solutions and come together and put faith in itself as opposed to outsourcing that entire civilizational activity to the state. That would be my position. That's uh, a great answer. Let me, <laughs> let me uh, not so much as uh, uh, dig holes into that argument, but explore it uh, by bringing Minakshi ji in, because when you talk of conscious Hindu society and conscious government, I mean, I can give you five or six examples where this government is supposed to do something not just for the Hindus, but for Indians. Do the right thing, and it's not. Five or six things, temple control, place of worship act, Hindus being returned to their homeland in Kashmir, and so many other things, but it's not. Let's look at the psyche of, let's say, people who follow Islam. Let's look at the psyche of the Middle Eastern uh, societies and Pakistan, Meenakshi ji. And here, after I uh, come to you, in fact, uh, yeah, I, I'll ask what questions been asked by Priya. Do you think there is a fundamental difference in the psyche where what the conscious society wants is echoed very quickly by the conscious government? In our case, in India's case, through some odd reason, I don't know, virtue signaling or whatever, that connect is not there. Absolutely. This is absolutely correct. Uh, there is no difference between uh, the Muslim masses in a Muslim society and the state. The state does what the masses want, the masses do what they want. Uh, and the thing is that religion is the unifying factor. Uh, the five principles of Islam, every Muslim in every country follows them. And territory has no importance for them because religion is something that crosses boundaries. And in India, we, for some reason, we, the territory matters a lot to us. So there's a fundamental difference between uh, Indian society and the Middle Eastern society, where religion is the uniting factor in the Middle Eastern society, and in India, it is not the uniting factor. Uh, which brings me to this, uh, Priya in the audience? Oh, there's, there's only one Priya in the audience? Oh, that's amazing. Oh, there's another one. If you say Rahul Gandhi, no one will, no hand will go up. But then we... So Priya has asked this question. Ek varish insaan ne kaha hai, uh, Hindu kabhi leader nahi ban sakte, kyunki we lack three characteristics of a good leader. Unpredictable, illogical, and the most important, ruthless. Uh, we Hindus, even today, seek a reason to not fight we are imbibed with the characteristics of can't fight. What do you have to say, uh, Sai, sir, in the present context? Uh, there's a very specific episode that I've touched upon in the book, which will directly answer Priya Kaushal's question. 
okay so uh, the so there is this uh, 1920 session of the congress this is the nagpur session which marks the beginning of the non cooperation movement most people think that the non cooperation movement was initiated or triggered because he wanted bharat ke liye independence no such thing he was actually fighting for the khilafat through the non cooperation movement he says as much in his own sessions he only wanted them to apologize for uh, uh, jallianwala bag there are only two mistakes that they wanted addressed jallianwala bag and this khilafat that's what happened now in that session gandhi effectively has become the leader of the congress because tilak dies in 1920 and effectively that space has been vacated so gandhi becomes imagine do you know who was the right winger of the time gandhi he was the extremist so he becomes the head of the garam dal and uh, Annie Besant, who was until then the leader of the garam dal becomes the leader of the naram dal which is the moderate portion okay gandhi who is a chela of gokhale who is a who was a staunch moderate becomes the leader of the extremist section of the congress kitne bure din the bharat ke imagine nahi to abhi bhi janeu dhari to gandhi hai na in that so for the non cooperation movement they have to frame certain rules and the constitution of the congress is being discussed gandhi effectively says we will adopt all legitimate and peaceful means he being the lawyer he chooses to remove the word lawful because you can't non cooperate by being lawful and therefore he says let's call it legitimate and peaceful means then there is a fantastic debate that happens between him and jinnah you must read it Jinnah effectively says, you want to use peaceful means with a fellow who has just proved his ruthlessness through the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. I mean, you'll get your independence, mil jayega, no problem. And he's also saying, during this entire period, it's not just the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, by the way. Most people don't realize that the governor, of, Lieutenant Governor of Punjab, in typical Vietnam style, was using machine guns and helicopters to drop bombs on the peasants of Punjab drop bombs on the peasants of Punjab, it was happening on a regular basis, before and after Jallianwala Bagh. So he says, how do you think you will even succeed with this? If you truly want to succeed in achieving your goals, please remove the option of peaceful. Please remove the option of peaceful because you cannot hope to succeed or get even a modicum of success through these means. He gets booed down by the entire Congress establishment. Jinnah says, I am not going to sink with this boat. I am getting out of this place. When you read that, you will realize that Jinnah was much more realistic about what was needed to get the job done. Jinnah lived in a real world. He didn't live in a bubble, a self-created bubble. And I will put it to vote to the audience. In a tug of war and in a battle of wills, did Gandhi win or did Jinnah ultimately win? Who secured a portion of his land, of this land for his people, is the question that you should ask. Because that's where the discussion ends. Everything else is useless. You decide the effectiveness of a particular ideology or, let's say, a movement on the threshold of impact, on the annals of impact. Jinnah achieved what he wanted and what he set out for, period. And he was clear that the means shall not limit the aims. No wonder he was open to the direct action day. Okay. One of the things that I think is the hallmark of a leader, and I agree with Priya on this particular question, is the ability to go calculatedly crazy. To say, I am capable of doing this, don't underestimate me. If you think you've read me inside out, you cannot. No wonder the West doesn't know what to do with Putin. <laughs> they don't know. They have no idea. No wonder Islamists cannot do what they do in Russia in any other place. People say, oh, he wants a Russian model. I am not saying any of those things. I am talking of attributes. If you wish to address your problems, the question would be, can you operate under the savior complex that you will repeat the failed methods of the past and still come out with a better solution? If the answer is a no, then you have to change your strategy. That's exactly why I'm making this point that the 1920s effectively revealed 
the willingness and the willpower of the opposite side, the resolve of the opposite side to do whatever was necessary to get the job done and the soft heartedness and the bleeding heartedness of this side. I think we are perhaps going through a similar cycle. But you know, then again, we had amazing leaders like Sardar Patel who were, I mean, uh, to answer your questions, you know, they basically takes all, everything, strong, um, just, leading from the front, but ultimately, they were emotionally blackmailed by a weak leader, Gandhi. So, uh, I mean, then how strong would you say Sadar Patel was? I mean, I, just to give you an example, in, when we were having our first war with Pakistan, and Jinnah demanded 55 crores, and Patel said, are you crazy? You're going to use you, uh, this money to buy weapons? And Gandhi said, no, we must give it to Jinnah because uh, it's their money. And Patel said, what are you talking about? And Gandhi went on a fast unto death. Patel had to buckle. That money was given and lo and behold, you know, arms were purchased. So who is weak there? So let me give you a response which perhaps people may not expect. You think of Patel as a strong leader because you always compare him with whom? <laughs> Nehru. And you are thinking of Gandhi and Nehru. So low. <laughs> okay. So, this is the tyranny and the trap of soft expectations playing itself out where even a Patel looks like a strong leader. Here's the question. Read for, I mean, read the evidence and the, let's say, the documents on Patel's position as well as there's a, a, a there's any, uh, a venue here, Vital Bhai Patel, right? His elder brother. Read their positions with respect to the revolutionaries. And then you ask yourself, what strongness and what strength are we talking about here? To me, the test is going to be simple. Not just who won. What was your position with respect to the armed resistance being given by the revolutionaries to the British? Here's the test and here's the evidence further. When people wanted to extend the boycott movement, see you have to realize the boycott movement and the Swadeshi movements were two different movements. Although they more or less achieved the same thing, they were two different strands. So while the Congress was more than happy to push for the Swadeshi movement, they did not want to extend the scope of the boycott movement beyond Bengal because that would mean treachery with the British which was against Congress's avowed policy in its constitution of that particular time, including supported by Mr. Patel. Which is exactly why I think I said in one of the discussions previously that by the time you're done with this book, all are heroes, all are villains, and you will have grudging serious respect for the man who ultimately delivered the goods. So let me ask you this straight up, Sai, because I, I remember at the, um, not quite the launch of the first book, but near about that time you said you aren't really, you haven't really made up your mind, your mind if our constitution is colonial in nature. At the end of this book, have you uh, come any closer to the truth? What do you think? Is it? My position at this stage would be that by the time of 1924, I have seen the sidelining of Sri Aurobindo. By 1910, after his release from the Alipur case, he was out of action. And he wrote a final open letter for which he was prosecuted and therefore he chose to go to Pondicherry and from there he chose to shine the light of spirituality in a very positive way. Uh, Lala Lajpat Shai was sidelined by 1924. Uh, Tilak was dead. Um, and uh, Bipin Chandrapal uh, had no other option but to nod along with Gandhi because he realized that thanks to the support of the Khilafatists, especially the Ali brothers, the Congress had been completely taken over by the, uh, by the Gandhi, uh, let's say, coterie, so to speak. So at least until 1924, notwithstanding the fact that it was allegedly led by a so-called extremist of that particular period, I see a heavy ingredient of pro-British loyalism heavy degree of pro-British loyalism. We were only asking for rights at par with the citizens of the crown in other colonies. That's all we were asking for. And the manner in which we celebrated our admission into the club of Commonwealth countries is embarrassing. You should simply read the proceedings of 1885 session of the Congress, which is when it was actually found. It was not a, a party or an organization. It was a platform, a conference of sorts of the Indian political union, which A.O. Hume had founded. By the time they're done with it, in fact, uh, you know, how, what was the language requirement for people to participate in the Congress? 
English. So why are you surprised that the constitution is written in English? And by the time they are done, the Jai Jai Kaur for the Queen is so loud and it's captured when you're reading the resolution and the proceedings, you can actually hear them shout. So during this movement against the partition of Bengal, the slogan is Vande Matram. Anand Mat and everything else is the source and the inspiration. Vande Matram goes through a fantastic change by the time you reach the 1920s. It becomes Vande Mata Pitarau. Pitarau, here is Britain and Mata is Bharat Mata. So they had changed the slogan to Vande Mata Pitarau. Now therefore my hopes keep going down further as I move towards the framing of the constitution. I was initially hopeful, but now I'm not really sure. But I will still wait for the evidence to present itself and then speak. But so India, yeah. that is Bharat. When will it manifest itself? The day we choose to junk India and go only with Bharat. Approximate time frame, ma'am. My reading of the situation is we are living through Khilafat 2.0. And therefore, 24 years, rather 23 years from the end of Khilafat in 1924 was the partition of the country. So today, I'm assuming that the timelines are still the same. I'm looking at a 25 year period. And that quarter of a century made a huge difference. But the pace at which the problem is now shouting from the rooftops, I would say 2030 would be a fairly critical year for us to wait and watch. And the Indian state, sorry, the Bharatiya state's response to the challenge will determine which way this country goes. According to me, 2024 is not important. 2030 is important because I think the demographics will start showing their impact by 2030. And I'm showing from the book how the altered demographics led to the partition of Bengal because people had become conscious by then that our population is more. 1.2 million or yeah, 1.92 crores versus 1.76 crores, Muslims versus Hindus with the population then, they moved. 17 years before the partition of Bengal, Syed Ahmad Khan in one of his speeches was conscious of the growing Muslim population in Bengal and he made a statement as much, we are already a growing majority, what do you think you can do to us? That's the statement that he openly made in one of his speeches. Tell me if the tone and tenor of the current day speeches that you hear from across the country is any different. So it's very interesting because you said 25 years. Incidentally, there's a video that's going viral. Uh, someone's taken a clip out of my um, uh, talk of when uh, in, in Pondicherry as I, I look at the crystal ball and I gaze at the future and I'm saying 24 to 26 is Modi, then uh, Amit Shah, then Yogi, then Yogi, and I say 46 to 49 is Jay Sai Deepak. <laughs> And that is, so he is going to oversee, he is going to oversee what he is predicting. I am in for serious trouble, I have been accused of having political aspirations despite my best intentions. This is now going to feed into that particular paranoia and they will say we always knew everything that he was doing was only aimed at power. I don't want that. So, uh, shall, uh, I think we are uh, running out I think, of time. I think we have ran way out of, uh, ahead of yeah, time. So, shall, yeah. One last question. Yeah, maybe that, one last uh, Yeah, one last and, question. And a pretty both. short answer. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So, I'll try my best. Uh, right. <laughs> 30 uh, seconds, know. please. Yeah. <laughs> this young man? Yeah. Two, two men. Agar yehi response apna chalta raha, to Bharat banne ki to asar nahi hai. You know, we, we talk about constitution, a set of rules that frames a society. There are theocratic states. There are states that are based on religion, and religion also is an idea that sets down rules through which a society should function. There are Islamic societies, and uh, Dr. Jain has worked a lot on Middle Eastern consciousness, and she's come to a conclusion that reform is impossible. You can't, because you have a set ideology. The question that I ask to both of you is, final question, just a couple of minutes, is that were India to become a Hindu Rashtra, to rephrase, reframe the rules that are going to decide the way the Indian society should function? And given that Hinduism is very prone, in fact, uh, the core of Hinduism is reforms, to assimilate the mutations and to reform and to become better and better and better. Do you think this would be better than a so-called Islamic theocratic state uh, is the question first to you, Sai, and then to you, Dr. Jain. I've said this before that a dharmic state is neither a theocratic state nor a theological state. 
A theocratic state is run by theocrats, a theological state is run by religion. A dharmic state is neither. Okay? A dharmic state effectively chooses to place dharma and therefore by that what we believe is righteous conduct at the heart of, let's say, its policy making. And therefore, a dharmic republic Bharat 2.0 would draw from principles of dharma from the basket of, let's call it 108 baskets available to it in the, in the basket of options. That's one. Two, is it possible? Is it feasible? I would say so. The problem is that we jump the gun by asking or framing the question in a slightly incorrect fashion because most people end up asking this question that should we start with the constitution by changing the constitution? No. You start with history you start, then you move to statecraft and therefore political science and then is when you're ready for a change in the constitution. One of the reasons that this book and this entire, now it's not a trilogy anymore, it's a quadrilogy, it's a tetralogy because it's, there are two more books now. It's not going to be uh, completed in the third book. Is that you stop seeing the constitution as the cause, in fact it is the effect and then it creates a certain effect. Okay, which is to say, after having been informed by history, it then creates a certain history of its own thanks to the manner in which it has been crafted. So my suggestion would be that you have, let's say, examples of a Kautilian state that Mr. Sanyal has already spoken of. You have multiple examples of how, let's say, a dharmic state is supposed to be run. What is the point of simply extolling Shivaji for his, let's say, feats against the Mughals? as opposed to also evaluating from the standpoint of how did he run his kingdom? What were the policies in place? Those are questions that we may have to seriously consider before we actually answer that particular question. Two, I think the more important question would be, how do you then look at the place of anti-Bharati groups in this dharmic state? My answer would be that unless and until you follow both a carrot and stick policy, Sorry? <laughs> Let me just uh, look at it this way. I, I don't think reform the way we understand it as Hindus is possible. Okay. Someone who understands only the language of power will have to be rendered toothless for him to listen to you. That's been the experience of history. The Ottoman Empire's arrogance and hubris was reduced after defeat. And after they ended up creating a Kemal Ataturk, who decided to abolish the Khilafat himself. Okay? But then the fantastic aspect of that particular group is that that cycle is complete and now you have an Erdogan who is now looking at crea creating another Khilafat. Which is exactly why I believe that the propensity for reform as much as we attribute to ourselves doesn't exist. And therefore projecting our experience and our worldview onto them would be the first fallacy that we should avoid. They don't subscribe to this at all. Someone says, uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia has decided to say that what is the authenticity of the Hadith and therefore let's just fall back on Quran. Well, Ahle Quran movements have existed in this country which effectively said the Hadith are not necessary and still you had these movements asking for Pakistan. So I don't think the so-called reinterpretation is going to work. Someone is very clear that any sign of compromise from your end is a sign of weakness. Then what do you, how do you convince them? Not by compromising. I can't add to what Sai has said, but as a student of history, uh, I feel that uh, we had a living link with our civilizational memory throughout the medieval period, in spite of all the turmoil and the lack of power and the absolute suffering. The way ordinary Hindus with no power, no wealth, what sacrifices they made to keep their dharma alive and to keep their sacred heritage, to protect their sacred heritage. Uh, that was something really remarkable. But how to get back that living link with the past? That living link with the past has been broken, according to me, because of 50 years of Marxist historiography. And it's very important, uh, if we want to move forward, is that we have to reconnect with our history, with our past, and to take pride in what we achieved in the midst of so, so much, uh, you know, torture and such adverse circumstances. If we could survive intact through that 1,000 years, there is no way that we cannot go back to that heritage 
and find the way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for the lovely discussion. I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of questions. I'm sorry, you know, what, in fact, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, Mr. J. Sai Deepak will be on an India tour very shortly. And for the next few months, he'll be doing book signings and events in multiple cities across India, like Delhi, Bangalore, Pune, Hyderabad, Chennai, and Indore. In fact, the details about this Did tour is going to Pakistan. <laughs> well, I'm not sure of that. So you can follow him. <laughs> Well, yes, so, so that information, of course, is given outside uh, where the books are kept. And yeah, so uh, with this, we come to the end of the uh, uh, ceremony. In fact, uh, if anybody wants to purchase a book, the signed books are already kept outside, you know, on the table. So you can go ahead and purchase one. And thank you so much for, uh, thank you to our esteemed speakers for this engaging and insightful discussion. Thank you once again for joining this evening. Thank you.